I wish I had some castanets, I would do some flamenco dancing for you, but I have none. Oh, well, hey, it's good to have you here this morning, uh, here in Bellingham, those of you in Skagit, thanks for joining us, those online with the live stream, glad you're with us today, and those in uh, Boca Raton at the Trinity Church of God, glad that you're here as well, as we're in the second week of Camino de Iglesia, the way of the church, and looking specifically at this ancient pathway and this timeless truths in today's church. That's kind of the tagline. If you were not here last week, I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing in, in uh, September, is that we are taking today's church, that's us, that's that part, but we're taking the timeless truths, that's God's word, but we're connecting those all with an ancient pathway uh, that my wife and I were able to participate in this last summer. It's called Camino de Santiago, the way of St. James. It's across Spain, ends up in Santiago. And it's, a, it's a, an ancient pilgrimage that people have been participating in for 1,100 years uh, to go to the relics there in, in Santiago. In fact, it has been reported that St. Francis of Assisi did a pilgrimage, did a Camino, in, somewhere in the year 1212 to 1214. St. Francis, uh, you may be familiar with the Franciscan order in the Catholic Church, Franciscan monks. Uh, he is also the patron saint of pe pets and animals, which is good, kind of a precursor to Dr. Doolittle. And also, uh, he's best known for a prayer that he didn't pray. Uh, he's been given recognition and attribution to the prayer, Lord, where there's, you know, hatred, let me sow love, where there's discord, let me serve peace, uh, where there's, uh, you know, falsehood, let me uh, sow truth. He didn't, he didn't pray it, but he gets the credit for it. There you go. All right, let's close. Anyway, he, he walked the Camino and, uh, back in 12, 12, 13, somewhere in there. The word Camino can be translated multiple ways. It can be a path, it can be a trail. It can be a translated road, even journey, but most often in this context, it's translated way, the way of St. James. And I really like that translation because it's a, it's a broader translation than just a geographical path to a destination. The concept of the way is that it's a way of life. It's a way of a, a lifestyle, not just with a destination in mind, but it's a lifestyle of transformation. And as I thought about that, that what better way to talk about the way, the Camino of the church, that yes, there is a destination and there's a day we'll be, we'll be complete with Christ and there's all of eternity, but between now and then, we are on this way of life of transformation. What's it say in 2 Corinthians? That we all with unveiled faces reflect the glory of God are being, present tense, you know, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. That's this path that every single one of us are on, no matter where you are in your spiritual journey. None of us have arrived. There's always a next step. There's this ongoing transformation. And so we're talking about how is it that we as a church and as individuals can live this lifestyle, this lifestyle of transformation. Now, the Camino de Santiago is different than other long walks. I mean, we've got some long walks here in the United States, the Pacific Crest Trail is a long walk. The Appalachian Trail is a long walk. And on those, you know, walks, you're out in the wilderness for days or weeks or months or years or however long it takes you to do that. And when we did the Camino de Santiago, there were some times when we were on a trail in the mountains or through the forest or out in the wilderness. But there were also times when we were on a pathway, a pathway that went through farmlands, through wheat fields, through vineyards, through pastures and cattle and, and and, and sheep and, and all these things. And there were also times when we were actually on a road, a road that would pass through small towns and villages, these little hamlets that were small, somewhere between usually a popula population of, of about 500 to about 5,000, these tiny little towns. So one morning, early on in the trip, 
There was probably an exceptional amount of walkers that morning, but we were on a road going to a little town called San Saul. And I took this picture of us going to San Saul, and here we are on this road walking the Camino up to San Saul. Now, if you were with us last week or you're familiar with the words of Jesus, you may remember we talked about when Jesus said, you know, a city on a, silk, uh, on a hill cannot be hidden. And so it's a kind of a great picture of that. But what you may also notice about this picture is that in this little town, this little village, right in the center, the biggest and tallest building is the church. And as we would go through these little towns, sometimes three and four times a day, these little villages, there was one thing they all had in common, that at the geographical center of these little towns was a church, and that church was the largest building and also the tallest building, and most of them housed uh, nests for storks, but that's a different story we won't talk about today. All of these, these little towns had a church right in the geographical center, and it was the tallest building. And as I was thinking about this and walking through these towns, I began to think about it in this concept of like concentric circles, that these little towns had been together for hundreds of years, some of the same families that had lived there generation after generation. But on the outer circle around the town would be the fields where they grew wheat or they had vineyards or they had their flocks and these things. And this is where the work would happen. And then, and then as you went in another circle, there was like the community and the family and then into the inner circle, the it's concentric circles, right in the center was the church and the church, all of life, revolved around it. Now because the church buildings were the tallest buildings, very often as we were walking, we could see a church building or a bell tower or a steeple long before we would ever see the town, but we knew. So one day we're walking, we're going through these fields, and we see this. Okay, well, it's beautiful flowers, beautiful countryside, but we see, oh, there's a church. What that means is there will be a town around that we can stop and have a cafe con leche, a Diet Coke, some Twix bars, whatever it might be. So sure enough, we go up over the hill, and there it was, the town, and in the center of the town was this church. And what's interesting is that for these little towns, for generations and generations, they would build these large churches in the center. And the church was like their identity. In fact, sometimes the reason that these churches are disproportionately large to the town surrounding is because they were in a competition maybe with another town to, to build a, a grander, more glorious you know, place to worship the Lord. But it was not only their identity, it was a point of reference because if you're out in the field working, you're like, okay, I got to get home. All you had to do is look for the tallest thing, and it was the church. And the church became a geographical point of reference. I follow that. I will be back into my town. It was a chronological point of reference because in the days that these churches were built, no one had watches. But at the top of the hour, the bell would chime, and you would know what time it is, where it is in the day. So it would kind of help you set that. It was a moral and spiritual and ethical point of reference as well to come to together, to, to, to read the scripture, to pray, to, to you know, celebrate the sacraments and those kind of things. And it was also a point of reference for life and eternity. While there's all of these circles of, of working and hardship and difficulties in life, at the center it was a reminder every week that there is something beyond these days, that this is our life. It's not just what we do. It's not even just our family. But there's something tr transcendent, something eternal that we are a part of. And I just began to see that and think about that and all kinds of thoughts. And then I wondered with these concentral circles, with, with the work and with the community and with the family and with the church, could you take it one step further? What about inside that church? Would there be one more concentric circle right in the center, the dead bullseye of all of it? Like, what is it for the church that is at the very middle? What is it that's at the center? What is it that hides the highest point? Where is it that we get our point of reference? Where is it that we find our identity? And I spent some time thinking about that, and that's what I want us to talk about today. Now, I'll warn you right up front, I'm going to give you some history, some church history, some Spanish history, some different things historically, a little bit, don't get bogged down in that. I also want us to look at two pieces of scripture, one of them very briefly, one of them not exhaustively, but metho uh, methodically. And I also want to say that no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, no matter what you think or what you believe, and we may believe differently, I want to say you are so welcome here. We are so glad. We can agree to disagree. There are some things where you might say, you guys are so far out there. We're still glad you're here. You're welcome. Stay, okay? But what I'm going to talk about today, I need you to know this. This is one of those areas that is an absolute non-negotiable for us. On this one, there's no wiggle room. We will not waver. 
This one we will not bring to the bargaining table. This one we won't compromise on. This is an absolute foundational truth that we will die on the hill for. Now, you don't have to believe it. You don't have to agree with it. I just want you to know where we're coming from. This is one that we will not sway from, okay? Okay, okay. all right. So you're saying, what is it? All right. It's the Sunday school answer for every question. All right. So what I want to do first is just look briefly at a passage that talks about what is it that is the center for us as a church, where we get our identity, that everything that we do revolves around, that we're, you know, it's, it's the centerpiece. And it's found in a letter that Paul writes to the church in Philippi. And in this letter, he's talking to this church, and he's trying to help them understand that, that they need to get along. And that in order to do that, they need to be humble, they need to be uh, servant-minded, they, they need to think about others, they need to get themselves, you know, and their ego put it aside and, 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 and just consider others as better than themselves. And in the middle of all this, trying to help them to have this unity, he quotes what many believe was a, a hymn from the first century, that, like the church would sing this hymn. And so he's talking about how, you know, you need, to, you need to be humble and you need to think of others and all this. And then in verse 5 of, of Philippians chapter 2, he says, your attitude, here we go, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Let's just cut to the chase. It ought to be Jesus. And what we find in this hymn is this picture of Jesus in his divinity, Jesus in his humanity, Jesus in utter humility, and Jesus in his majesty. He says, you ought to have the same attitude that Jesus, who, who, while he was in very nature God, I mean, he was God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. While he had this entitled to him, he didn't hold on to it tightly. Instead, it says, you know, that while in very nature God, he did not consider equality with God something to grasp, he made himself nothing. This was a decision that he made. That he would put his own limitations on himself. He would pour himself out, made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. So here's the creator becoming the created and then becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So he paints this picture of the almighty God who doesn't hold on to that Godhead, becomes a human and now sacrifices himself. In in response to that, as a result of that, because of that, he follows up and says, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is at the epicenter of the church. This is the high point to which we can always find a point of reference, is Jesus. This is the name that is above every name, that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is the center of the church. Everything else must revolve around that fact, and on that one, we will not sway. Okay? Now, I said that in my trip across Spain, uh, I really enjoyed some of the historical pieces of that, both church and Spanish history, and sometimes those lines were very blurred because they were all together. One of the things that was um, intriguing to me had to do with the Knights Templar. Now, I'll just say this. The first time in my life that I remember being aware of the Knights Templar was Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. I must have slept through some other history classes, but when that movie came out, the Knights Templar, some of you remember, for some of you, it's when you started reading Dan Brown novels, which are, by the way, novels, not truth. Anyway, that's where, and there's a lot of myth and a lot of story that surrounds the Knights Templar, but they were an actual order. They, they actually existed for about 200 years, from I think it was 1119 to 1312, uh, and they were, this is almost kind of funny to say, they were the military branch of the Catholic Church, which I'm thinking we might uh, instigate a military branch of Cornwall. <laughs> it's a thought, probably not a good one. They were a military branch of the Catholic Church. And uh, so one day we're walking and we go into this town, uh, Pomferrado, and uh, you know, they go across this beautiful bridge over this river and we come around this corner and I see this. And I was like, oh! Wow, that is so cool. It's a, it's a, a 12th century castle, and it's Castillo de los Templarios. It's the, the castle of, of the Templars. And we were having a rest day the next day. It was going to be my, it, it was my birthday, uh, June 23rd, in case you're taking notes. I, I turned 55. And, um, and, I, and we had a rest day, and I said, Doreen, the only thing I want for my birthday is we have to tour that castle. That is just so unbelievably cool. So the next day, we did 
And it was just amazing to me. I mean, I could go on for hours about this castle and how they had this underground tunnel down to the river so they get water when they're in the siege and the turrets and how they're, anyway. So we go in there, and, but was reading a lot about these Knights Templar, these, these guys. Most of us are familiar when we hear Knights Templar, we think of the Crusades, and that was a big part of it. And, and it's a horrible thing of some of, the, some of the things that, the atrocities done in the name of God and the church in the Crusades. It's horrible. It's, it's one of the, the worst chapters of, of Christian history uh, of what happened there in the name of God. It's horrible things. But there was more to the Knights Templar than just Crusades. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but this fraternity, this order, had put together this economic infrastructure throughout Europe. It was a, it was a way early precursor to the concept of international banking. It was an amazing thing, the, the organization they had on that. Not only that, but they were protectors of common folks, and they were providers, and they had land that they owned, and castles that they owned, and churches, and all this. And they were a very, very powerful organization, and in fact, made a very big impact on a good way. As much as they've done negative, they did very positive things as well. But their power and their influence began to be a threat to those who were in titles and, and positions of power and authority. In fact, a little side note, whether you want it or not, it says nothing to do with the Bible or, or the sermon. You know how Friday the 13th is like, you know, that, not just the movies, but the whole concept of the Friday the 13th. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the whole concept of Friday the 13th being this weird day finds its roots with the Knights Templar. Because on October 13th, Friday, October 13th, 1307, uh, King Philip IV of France, with the permission of Pope Clement V, had all of the knights rounded up, the vast majority of them arrested, many of them forced to make um, confessions, and many of them put to death, and it happened on Friday the 13th. Thus, it becomes a very dark day. That's why to this day. Now, that has nothing to do with anything, but a cool fact nonetheless. All right. So, so I have, oh, the reason I'm telling you any of this at all is because one of the things about the Knights Templar is that they had a motto that they lived by. It was a Latin motto. It was very often in, in, engraved on their swords. It was always on their shields. It was a motto that they lived by in Latin. And I taught myself everything I know about Latin yesterday. So I will read this to you in Latin. This was their motto. Non nobis domine, non nobis. Sed nomini tuo de gloriam. All right. E pluribus unum. All right, that's on the dollar, I think. Okay, what that means, that phrase, is word for word from Psalm 115, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. With everything else that they had done, they said, everything we do, all of our efforts, our lives, our fighting, we do it not for our own glory, not for the glory of the Knights Templar. We do it for one purpose, for the glory of the name that is above all names. And I thought, with everything else, what if the church, the capital C church, would say, this is our motto. It's not about building a pastor's kingdom. It's not about building a denomination. It's not about doing something for the name of this church. It's about lifting up the name of Jesus. All that we do, not for our glory, but for the glory of the name that is above every name. So that's what, that's what these, these Knights Templar, that's how they lived their life. Well, that order dissolved in 1312. And then about 200 years later, in Germany, there was a, a, a monk named Martin Luther who loved the church. He'd given his life to the church. And yet he saw some areas where the church had kind of gotten off track. In fact, in some places had gone completely off the tracks. And not in a desire to split the church, in a desire to make the church pure again. He says, we've got to confront these things. And it wasn't well received, and it started what was, we now refer to as the Reformation. Uh, some would see it as the biggest split in church history, but the Reformation. And the Reformers said, these are the things we need to hold on to. And there were these five, what they call the five sole, five sole, these, these things, these five statements. There was sola fide, sola gratia, Sola Scriptura, Soli Deo Gloria, and Solus Christus. These five things. Solus Christus is translated Christ alone. And each of these five soles, we're talking about these things alone. Sola, uh, sola Fide, it's by faith we are saved. It's by faith. I mean, this is in Ephesians. It's by faith that we are saved. Sola Gratia, it is only because of the grace of God that we can be saved. It's not about us, it's about God's grace. 
sola uh, scriptura, that our authority comes not from tradition, our authority comes not from even the Pope, our authority comes from scripture alone. Uh, Soli dia gloria, all of it is for God's glory. But this solus Christus is by Christ alone. They were confronting an issue, this idea that you could kind of buy your salvation. You could pay money, and and for those loved ones of yours who died in a bad way, and they're suffering in in purgatory, you could kind of get them out, buy them out early. You could just make a little donation, and they get forgiven, and all this stuff. And they said, no, 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 it is by Christ alone. You can't buy your salvation. You can't earn your salvation. You can't buy it for someone else. And why this was such a profound thing, it's in Scripture. Acts 4 says this, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Christ alone. Jesus is the epicenter, not only of the church, he is the epicenter of salvation and of faith. Last week I referenced where Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. That he is the way. It's Christ alone. But it, it wasn't just this, I mean, it, it is the, the, the grand scheme of, of salvation, but it's also, what about the heart? What about the passion? What about the affection we sang about this morning? What about the church, the people of God? Because Jesus said when he was confronting the churches in Revelation, he, he confronted the church in Ephesus, which had been a, an amazing powerhouse for the gospel, and yet something had happened over the years. There had been some drift And he says to this church in in Ephesus, he says, yet this I hold against you, you have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen, repent and do the things you did at first. What is that first love? It's Jesus. You've gotten involved with all of these other things. And the church can get to this point where we get off the track, our our eyes get away from what is the first love, and that is Jesus. And it's not just the church. How about us as individuals? This, uh, this last week, our elders went away for uh, a time of uh, scripture reflection and prayer. It was a beautiful uh, time together. One of the scriptures we reflected on in the afternoon was this time where Jesus confronts Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me more than these? And he asked him that three times. And we just spent some time talking about it. And I was thinking about if Jesus were asking me, Bob, do you love me more than these? What is the these in my life? And he says, you know what? Am I your first love? Am I your first love? Is everything else pale in comparison? With this picture of a Christ who has given himself, he is the Lord above all lords, the name above all names. He is the highest point. I don't know if you noticed, but I've got some chickens on the platform here with me. They are, they are very well behaved. We have our chicken cam. Is it working? Okay, there we go. All right, sweetheart. Very well behaved chickens. They're scared to death this is their first time they've ever been to church. (laughs) You may be wondering, why does he have chickens in church? Some of you, it doesn't, you're like, well, that's Bob. (laughs) Um, There is a reason why I have some chickens. You know, maybe we could have a potluck. (laughs) And invite them. I'm not talking about eating them. What are you guys, are? oh, you guys are mean. You're talking about eating these, these, help. Um. There's a reason that I have these chickens on, on, on the stage here with me. So we walked into this little town called Santo Domingo de la um, Calzada. Santo Domingo de la Calzada, again, smaller town, churches, and a cathedral. Again, disproportionately large, tallest building, the cathedral. And what's interesting is in this cathedral in Santo Domingo, there's a cathedral coop, a chicken coop in the cathedral. And I thought, hey, they can have one, we can have one, right? I mean, why not? But it seems that Pope Clement VI in 1350 gave permission and a special dispensation for a rooster and hen to be able to be housed in the cathedral. And I thought, there must be a story here because while the church has done incredible things in the name of Christ and humanity, housing stray chickens has not been one of them. But I went into this cathedral. I wanted to tour this. I'd read about it, and so I I paid my entrance. They had to pay to go uh, tour this cathedral, which I'm thinking about implementing here. But 
I paid my entrance and I went in and sure enough on the back wall is this, this area with this chicken coop and uh, it's got some chickens on the side and then when you zoom in on this little area, sure enough there are these live chickens. And I'm thinking, this is amazing and there's a story behind it. And this is one of those areas where legend and myth and story and years blur truth and gospel and history and it all kind of smears together. But wow, what a story. It seems that there was a family from Germany, a husband, a wife, and their son, their 18-year-old son named Huguenel, who were on a Camino themselves. They were going to Santiago. And they stopped in Santo Domingo to stay for a, a day, a week, I'm not sure how long, but they stayed in an inn. This young man, uh, Huguenel, was 18 years old and apparently a, a fine-looking young gent. And the innkeeper's daughter was kind of smitten by Huguenel, kind of taken by him, and maybe kind of put out some overtures like there might be interest in something beyond just being the innkeeper's daughter, to which those overtures were not reciprocated. Wise man, Huguenel. <laughs> Godly young man. You're on a pilgrimage. No women. Here we go. Eyes on Christ. Okay, so he, he said no. Well, I don't know who said this, but I'll quote, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned even a young woman. So to get back at her in her anger and her broken heart, she took a silver cup and placed it in his luggage. A story very similarly found in Genesis 44 with Joseph and his brothers. And as they went out of town, she cried, someone has stolen my silver cup. I think it was Huguenel. They went out, opened his luggage. Sure enough, there's a silver cup. And now he is a convicted felon. He has stolen this. And the, the, uh, the punishment for thievery was to be hanged, so Huguenel was hung from the gallows. I know it. But his parents were on a pilgrimage, and their son is dead, so they continue on. I mean, sticking around isn't going to bring him back. They continue on. They go to Santiago. They get their Compostelo. And on their return home, they say, well, let's stop in Santo Domingo and see our son's grave. And as they come into Santo Domingo, they go out to see where their son should be buried, and he's still hanging from the gallows alive and they're like son and he said I know I prayed to Santo Domingo and he's been holding me up I'm still alive so they ran to the mayor's house who was preparing to sit down for dinner with his friends and a couple of roasted chickens and they said our son whom you hung is still alive and his response was your son is no more alive than these two roasted chickens were prepared to eat at which time they immediately sprung to life, sprouted feathers and a beak, and began crowing, uh, uh, uh. What a story. <laughs> I read that and I thought, that is too good to leave in a book. That has got to make its way into a sermon. <laughs> Today is that day. So, with that miracle in mind from Santo Domingo, which part of what allowed him to be uh, as a saint, the Pope said, you can house chickens to this day. There are chickens housed in the back of the cathedral. And over the years, as people would make pilgrimages, they would hear this story, this miracle, and they would go to the cathedral in Santo Domingo not to worship Jesus, but to see the chickens. <laughs> because those chickens, apparently, to this day, are the direct descendant of the roasted ones who came back to life. And they would take their stick and they would bang the cage and hope that maybe one of the feathers of the chickens would come off and they could have it. I think it was a precursor to the lucky rabbit's foot. We'd have a chicken feather. And they would all come about this, around this chickens. And even now, even now, the cathedral is best known for the chicken coop. And in the town, there are these little chicken pastries that are called the miracle of the saint. And as we were leaving town the next day, we are going into another church. And at the altar was this saint with chickens. And as I was walking again with hours to think and to contemplate and what was all this, and I, and I got to thinking about this story and it made me laugh. And it, but then I wrote this in my journal, thinking about us as a church, thinking about the church. Are we chasing chickens or pursuing Christ? Because there's a lot of things that we do and good things and God-honoring things. But if they become the focal point, if they become what's most important, that's chasing chickens. Who is at the epicenter of the church? It's Jesus. Who is the highest in the church? It's Jesus. Who is the name above all names? Who is the Lord of all? It's Jesus. Anything else 
ultimately is chasing chickens. So what I want us to do in the remainder of our time is to visit another passage of Scripture to just remind us of why it is that in the church, Jesus must always be the one that we get our identity from. He must be the one that we follow. He must be the one around which everything revolves. He must always take the center and the highest place in the church. It's found in Colossians chapter 1. We're going to start at verse 15. In this passage, if you want to follow along, you can get there. In this passage, we see this incredible picture of who Jesus is, this description of his character traits and, and his abilities. And uh, Jerry Hawthorne, uh, a, a, a theologian and a, and a scholar, he said about this passage that we're going to look at, this is not only, not only a literary masterpiece, it is the mountaintop of Christological statements. This is the pinnacle. This is the apex. This is the zenith. It doesn't get any higher than this. And I want us to just walk through this passage. Verse 15, it says, and he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. This, again, is its area where we will not waver. Now, you may not agree with us, and you may not believe this. You're still welcome here. But we at this church believe that Jesus was not just an avatar from God. We don't believe that he was just a sage, just a shaman, just some kind of a, a, you know, a healer or, or teacher. We don't believe that Jesus was just a prophet. We don't believe that he was an angel. We believe that Jesus is God. Amen. The Bible says that there is one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord your God is one. And I don't fully grasp how this all works out. There is one God, but he reveals himself as the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That is three in one. Jesus himself said to his disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. And here we see it again, that he is this image of the invisible God. Not only that, but he's the firstborn over all creation. And that firstborn isn't a, a chronological order. The firstborn is a, it's a, a rank of authority that he is over all of creation. And there's a reason that he is firstborn with authority over all of creation. Here's the reason. For by him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. That all things, see, sometimes we get this idea that, well, there was God and he did all that creation stuff and then in the year zero at Christmas, Jesus was born. No, I mean, yes, but no, Jesus from the beginning, you see this in Genesis 1, John 1, Colossians 1. Jesus is the creator of all things. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and he spoke the word. In John chapter 1, which we're gonna look at extensively in December, about the word was with God and the word was God. And everything that has been created was created by him. Nothing that has been created that has not been created except by him. And now in Colossians 1, we see again where he is a creator of all things. And then look at this, things in heaven and on earth. How is it that he could say in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me because he created all things in heaven and earth. So the authority is his. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. It's like the heavenly things were created by him, the earthly things were created by him. The spiritual things were created by him, the material things were created by him. The eternal things were created by him, the temporal things were created by him. The visible things were created by him, the invisible things were created by him. He created all of it. I don't know if you've ever thought about this visible and invisible piece without getting into the too weird stuff. The visible creation of God is amazing. You see the mountains, you see the stars, you see the galaxies. It's phenomenal. You see the, the pounding waves of the ocean and the power. You see beautiful flowers in spring. You see the season. All this visible creation is amazing, and Jesus created all of it. But what about those invisible things that we don't see? What about those things we see the effect of but we don't see? I mean, why is it that a little seed can be stuck in a dark, airtight envelope in the bottom of your drawer for decades, lying dormant. And then one day you come across and say, oh, I had to plant that. And while it's been sitting there for decades, you put it in dirt and something whispers to it. And then it germinates. How does that happen? Who, where would that whisper come from? We didn't see it. We see the effects of it. And then as that grows and sprouts some roots and some, some leaves and comes out, and then there's this process of photosynthesis. Who tells the tree to have photosynthesis? Where does that invisible thing come from, that process? These laws of nature. What causes a little caterpillar to say, you know what, I think I'll wrap myself up in a chrysalis and I'm going to come out as a butterfly. Who does that? 
How about a salmon that's been out in the, in, the, in the ocean just swimming around having a great time thinking, you know what, I think I'm going to head home. No road signs and no map and no GPS goes right back to the very river that goes up to the very stream to the very little pool where it was hatched. How does that, what about the navigational system of a homing pigeon? Where do all these invisible things come from? Jesus created all of them. It's an amazing deal. He says, don't you see? And then he, then he turns the, 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 the page a little bit. He says, and it's not just this world around. It's the nations, it's, it's the authorities, it's the, the empires, it's the dynasties, the things that have all this power. It says he's created those as well, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. Not only did he create all things, he is the source of everything. He is the object of everything. Everything was created for his good pleasure. Everything was created for his joy. Everything was created for his glory. The heavens declare the glory of God. And he goes on. He says, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Again, this before, yeah, we can say chronologically, but I think it goes beyond. I think it transcends that. I think it's his preeminence that he surpasses all things, that he's beyond all things, and in him all things hold together. Why is it that spiral galaxies don't spiral out of control? Because in him all things hold together. We live in a universe that is so precisely precision tuned, finely tuned, and it holds together, and it's predictable, and it's all this picture of of someone that's in control, something that's keeping it all together. Why is it that our earth is tilted just perfectly at 23.5 degrees on its axis? And it, every 24 hours, makes a little turn, and then every 365 days makes its way around the sun. And as that axis goes around the sun, why is it that we know on June 21st, as this axis was tilted closest to the sun, where the sun in the northern hemisphere seems to be farthest north on the horizon, it makes for the longest day, and from that point they become shorter so that next week on September 22nd, when the sun goes across the celestial equator that across our planet for the one day, there's equal daylight and equal night throughout our planet, and then it starts going the other direction so that by we get to the time in, in December 21st and the axis is tilted away that we have the shortest day. What's to keep from the 22nd and the 23rd getting shorter and the 20 fifth and then it'd be night forever it's because it's all held together by jesus he's the sustainer he's the creator he holds it all together five times in this passage already he uses this word all jesus is all and he is complete he is all and he is complete when you begin to see who this jesus is in all of his awesome power in his majesty and his transcendence and his creator and his sustainer you begin to understand why he is the center of all things And then he turns another corner. He says, what about us? Jesus is the head of the church, head of the body, the church. Jesus alone. Hear me out. There is no pastor who is the head of the church. There's no priest. There's no bishop. There's no pope. There's no board. There's no committee. There's no superintendent. There's no denomination. Jesus is the head of the church of the body, the church. He alone is at the center. He alone is exalted. He alone is the one that we worship and we look to as the head of the body. And he conquered our biggest fear, the last enemy to be conquered. says he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that now in everything, nothing withstanding, he might have the supremacy. He conquered the grave. He conquered death. He conquered eternity. That's why he is lifted up. That's why he is exalted. And then Paul just comes full circle and says, let me just remind you again about this Jesus and who he is. When it says, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. He is God. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Look at the direction of this. It's God who reconciles us to himself. We don't reconcile God to us. God says, I am continually drawing you to me. And it's my peace that will bridge this gap of of the division that has happened. And it's going to happen because of my sacrifice, because of my blood. 
That Jesus is not only the creator of all things, not only the sustainer of all things, not only the source and the object of all things, he's the redeemer of all things. Do you, do you begin to see that when you get a proper view of who Jesus is, anyone or anything else that we would put in the center point is like chasing chickens. Because Jesus alone is where we get our identity. And Jesus alone is where we revolve around. Very important for us to keep this very clear so that throughout our lives, throughout our ministries, throughout our churches, there would be a separation of the peripheral and the priority. There's a lot of good things we do, and we should do them. A lot of great things that will continue, and they honor God, and they help uh, humanity, and it's wonderful things. But only Jesus is this non-negotiable that will never change as the center. That's why as a church, we worship Jesus. We exalt Jesus. We follow Jesus. We submit to Jesus. We surrender to Jesus because he is at the center. Here's something that's mind-boggling. We sang about it today. That this transcendent, all-powerful creator, sustainer, redeemer of all things is unbelievably personal. Not just for the world, not just for the church, but for you as an individual. And our goal with this is Christ in you. Christ in you. That we would have Christ within us. What about what's at the center of our life? As individuals, where do we get our identity? What does everything else revolve around in our life? Is it Christ? Paul would write this about this great mystery. You say, to them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles, that's most of us there, the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That we have this treasure in jars of clay. It's Christ within us. And so Paul says, that's why we do what we do. Look at how he concludes this. He says, we proclaim him, Christ, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. Let me just ask you again. Why do you think we want you to gather together with the body of Christ to worship and hear from his word? Why do you think we want you to be in the word of God on your own, learning and studying? Why do you think we want you to pray and have that a priority in your life? Why do you think we want you in a small group, in a discipleship quad? Why do you think we want you to, to be serving? Why, why do you think we want any of this? It's so that you will know Christ better. So you grow in Christ deeper. You will reflect him more clearly. You will be transformed more into his glory and you will lift up his name and glorify him. That's why. That Christ is not only the center of the church, that he would be the center of our lives. That everything we are and do would revolve around that. L let me read for you this prayer I've read before from St. Patrick. He prayed this. Christ in me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ with me. Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise. Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in the eye of everyone who sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. Christ in me. Solus Christus. Christ alone. That's the way of the church. Everything for us as a church, everything for us as followers after Christ is chasing chickens. This is what we want for you. This is what we want for us. This we will not waver on. Christ alone.